I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves your day. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow with clearer form. I'm in the glory land way. Listen to the call, the gospel call today. Get in the glory land way. Wanderers come home, oh, hasten to obey. For I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow with clearer form. I'm in the glory land way. Onward I go, rejoicing in his love. I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see him in that home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow with clearer form. I'm in the glory land way. Well, good evening. If you have your Bibles, uh, get over to Psalm chapter 2. Psalm 2. We're going to read that tonight. I'm wondering when the last time it was that you had a meltdown, like a through a fit. Like really got so mad that you uh, you've lost it. I was thinking the other day about all the memories that we keep, the pictures, the videos that we keep of our kiddos. Uh, I've got pictures of my kids eating. I've got pictures of my kids swimming. I've got pictures, videos of my kids opening presents. But rarely, when they threw a fit, when they cried, when they were upset, when they had a meltdown, would I ever think to take out a camera? and say, oh, I want to come back to this moment. I Maybe it was over sports. Maybe your team, oh, I don't know, got all the way to game seven of a national championship and lost in the last seconds. Some of us remember those experiences. George Brett had a very famous meltdown. Uh, it was July 24th of 1983. He was playing for the Kansas City Royals that was there in Yankee Stadium. It was the ninth inning. Third baseman George Brett gets up, future Hall of Famer, facing another future Hall of Famer by the name of Goose Gossage, which is such a great name. Sure enough, George steps to the plate, hits a two-run two run home run, and uh, gives his team a four to five, a five, excuse me, a five to four lead over the hated Yankees, in which Billy Martin, the manager at the time, takes George Brett's bat and notices, or maybe knew this to be true, that the pine tar, there was too much pine tar on the bat. Some of you know this very famous story. And sure enough, after looking at the bat, uh, the home plate umpire, a guy by the name of Tim McClellan, ruled that Brett was, that there was excessive pine tar, called him out, overturned the home run, and it ended the game. And Brett lost his mind. If you want to have some fun later, just type in George Brett. It may be the thing he's most remembered for, which is crazy because he was a Hall of Fame player, played for years uh, at the highest level. Just a wonderful player. Maybe you've had a meltdown uh, on the road driving. Somebody who's just, well, we use words like idiot when we shouldn't. But, uh, but you have a meltdown because of other people are inconsiderate. Oh, Growing up, it's always seemed like we timed our meltdowns for the drive on the way to church. It was World War III in the backseat of that 1974 Ford LTD. And uh, there's always something funny to think about. My sister and brother and I fighting, my, my mom and dad swatting at us, and then walking into church, painting smiles on our faces to go in and worship. Maybe our meltdown right now is over this virus, over the state of our world, the state of our nation. Maybe we're melting down because we're concerned about the economy. That's something to melt down over. Or quite possibly, if you're like me, you feel like you're not getting the, all the, the, true, uh, the true news. And so you, you get upset when you read headlines or when you watch cable news shows. 
oh, it's easy to melt down over elections, isn't it? It's easy to, to, to get this sense that the powers that are around us, the powers that rule us, do not have our best interest at heart, and it depends on which party you're a part of, oh, and who's in power at the time. But it's easy to melt down over those things. Psalm chapter 2 has a meltdown of sorts. I want you to hear, we're going to take it in pieces. I won't read the whole thing for you in one sitting, but here we go. Look at verse 1. He says, Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointing, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. And so there's a good question to ask here is who's talking? Um, <clears throat> you might be tempted to say, well, if it's a psalm, it's David. Well, that's true for about 75 total psalms. Psalm 2 actually is attributed to David. It's attributed to him in, um, you know, in, in where it's, it's quoted again throughout uh, the rest of Scripture. We found it a lot in the New Testament. But there's a lot of other people who wrote psalms. There's Asaph and the sons of Korah and my favorite, He-Man, whose castle Grayskull place that I had. I think it's maybe pronounced Haman. Solomon wrote some. There's a psalm of Moses in Psalm 90. Uh, Ethan the Ezraite. Uh, another 48 psalms that are just anonymous. It's hard to say if David actually wrote this psalm because some David psalms are attributed to him when they were written for him or uh, maybe written by someone in his court. And so there's at least eight different authors, some other anonymous writers. You may already know this, but the psalms were written over a long period of time. So an, a, really a thousand year period. Imagine that, that uh, a body of work that would have started in the dark ages would be continuing to add to today. It's a pretty amazing thought. And so you would want to know what time this was referencing at what time is David talking about this? Um, a Psalm of, of Moses is important because of what's happening with Moses. They're coming out of exile. They're coming out of, of captivity. There's Psalms I'm getting ahead of myself written during the Babylonian captivity. Imagine that. Uh, something that, that started in the life of Moses went all the way to the life of Ezra, to Daniel. And here are these enduring songs. I'm thinking about on Facebook. I, I, I'm kind of tired of it, but people say, uh, someone has challenged me to, to put up uh, my favorite 10 albums. And here, here, just no, you know, I'm not saying anything about it, I'm just putting up my favorite, most influential songs or albums. Psalms can be like that. Psalms written over such a long period by all these different authors in, in different circumstances, um, well, they become important. It's, it becomes important to know why somebody would reference those things at that time. And so here's these popular songs. Uh, think of it as those album covers on Facebook. What's happening at the time? Was it from the teenage years of David? Was it when he faced Goliath? Was it when he was uh, being chased by Saul? Was it later in his in his uh, kingdom when uh, his son was trying to lead a coup against him? I, I, I love I love how one writer one one uh, commentator. He, he writes about, about writing during different periods, and he says, The idea is like a raging sea in the midst of a storm. The waves are relentlessly beating against an object one after another. This is a picture of humanity's constant attempts of being their own gods. That's true of the thousand years that the Psalms were written, and it's true even up until today. Spurgeon writes about those first three verses of Psalm 2, he says, we have in these first three verses a description of the hatred of human nature against the Christ of God. Imagine that. We are tempted from time to time to, to believe that our faith, our religion, I, hate, I don't like that word, uh, our following of Christ is somehow at stake because uh, maybe we've entered into a time of persecution. What's really interesting about Psalm 2, and I think I've told you this before, is how often it shows up in other parts of Scripture. Not only that it shows up, 
but where it shows up. And in Acts 4, uh, there's that Luke tells this great story about Peter and John on the way to the temple, and they they uh, they they heal a, a lame man, and they get in trouble with the Sanhedrin, and they're, they're dragged in front of the Sanhedrin, and they're told not to speak, and Peter and John say, which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. And I, I well, I don't just think, I, I think I know that they're feeling this idea of why do the nations conspire against us? Why do I think that? Because Peter and John are released. That's how the story goes. They go back to that young church, that group of people meeted, uh, meeting together. It says that in verse 24, this is Acts 4.24, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? Isn't that something that Peter and John centuries later when they're feeling literally persecuted, uh, hauled in front of this court to defend what they're doing and what they're saying and warned not to preach. The words that are so quickly on their tongue <laughs> are, are from one of their favorite albums, Psalm chapter 2. It's the song lyrics that come to, mo- come to mind. It's those, those, those songs that were the anthem of your youth or when you were courting your wife or when your kids were young. They're so ingrained into us that maybe they come out naturally and that's how Peter and John respond. If you think today that the people of God are somehow besieged by the enemies of God, And you're starting to maybe melt down a little bit because you're feeling the pressure. We're told we can't meet. We're told we can't do this. We can't do that. We shouldn't say this. And if you feel like the the enemies of God are plotting ways to marginalize us, to silence us, to discredit us, I can only say this. Well, welcome to the party. Because that's always been the case for the people of God. It was the way for Moses and for David and for Ezra and for Daniel and for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and for John and for Peter and for us. In verse 4 of Psalm 2, it says, The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. So God's reaction to all this, God's reaction Uh, might be like us watching George Brett lose his mind. Boy, in the moment he was incensed, he was enraged. But we watch that and we laugh because it looks like an old man acting like a little kid. And somebody just happened to be recording at the time. God doesn't tremble and wring his hands and say, oh no, my people haven't been able to come to that building that they put together to worship me. Instead, he says... They're going to worship me in their homes. They're going to take care of people's needs right in their own backyard. He doesn't stand up and get a closer look. Uh, He just stays seated. God's not in the least bit threatened by the, the agencies that try their best to pretend like he doesn't exist. In fact, he he laughs at them. And throughout this Psalm, this is why I think this Psalm Uh, gets on so many people's Facebook page, as it were. This this psalm continues to allude to this king. Verse 7. I proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I've become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. So when you hear son of God, you think one thing. When the writers of the psalm heard this for the first time, they thought something different. And they thought something different for a really long time because Jesus didn't come around to be the son of God, as it were, until many years later. And so when they heard son of God, they thought of kings. They thought of pharaohs. They thought of rulers. 
And, and this, this great little piece here, he says, you will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them like pieces of pottery. What he's referring to, it, it, it sounds like, uh, maybe it sounds like somebody throwing a fit, but this was actually a custom of ancient Near East kings. They would write the names of the countries that they had seized in war, that had become their subjects, that they had conquered. They would write their names on clay pots, and then they would take out, the king would take out his scepter, and he would smash these clay pots. It sounds a little juvenile. It sounds like a kid throwing a fit. But God invites his kids, his children, us, into his throne room, and he installs Jesus as the everlasting king. But notice what he does when he says this, or how he invites us into the relationship. It's beautiful. In verse 12, he says, Kiss the son, or he will be angry, and your way will lead to destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Kiss the son. What an intimate act. No one would think of doing that to a king. They would bow before a king. They would um, kneel before a king. They might even prostrate themselves before a king. But what subjects would come before them, themselves, before their king, and, 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 and think to kiss him? But Jesus is the son all throughout scripture. In fact, in God's own voice at his baptism, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. At the transfiguration, there on, that, on top of that mountain, uh, there's Moses and Elijah and there's Jesus. And then while they're speaking, there's this cloud that envelops them and a voice from the cloud that says, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. Or in Hebrews, I love how the Hebrew writer in, in uh, chapter 1, verse 3, he says, the son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of of his being. Kiss the sun, David says. That's where your refuge is. That's where your safety is. So in the middle of your meltdown, don't forget to stop and kiss the sun. Our son Parker, when he was little, he would have a meltdown. One that we could count on. Uh, every day that he would come to preschool here at We School, uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, he would go to class he would lay down in the middle of the floor and have a fit. And it was, you could set your watch by it. It wasn't too unruly. His, in fact, his, his teachers would, would laugh about it. But I always loved one of his fellow students, a little girl. She would look at, look at Parker. She would shake her head and she would say, oh, Paco, oh, Paco. She just thought, like we did, that it was a bit sad and a bit ridiculous. When you start to feel the pressure, when you start to feel like the whole world is conspiring against us. Remember that God laughs in the face of those who set up against him. And more than that, that he invites us to kiss the sun. So in the Roman Empire, uh, there was this emperor named Diocletian, and uh, he had a twofold purpose. One was to extend the borders of the Roman Empire, which was pretty much every leader of the Roman Empire. And his second was he wanted to stomp out Christianity. He wanted to get rid of all Christians. I think he's the poster child for Psalm 2, for the enemies of the church, for the enemies of God, for the enemies of God's people. And there was even a medal. They would strike coins back in the day. And you could still find these. They're, they're I'm sure, worth a lot. And it says the name of Christians, it has this inscription on the coin that says the name of Christians being extinguished. And there was uh, these two pillars in Spain that were, that were raised that were as, a, uh, as, a, uh, as an honor, as, as a way of, of, of really bringing honor and tribute to Diocletian. And, and the, on those two pillars, it says this, Diocletian, Jovian, Maximian, Herculeus, Caesarus, Augusti. That's his full name. For having extended the Roman Empire in the East and the West, and for having extinguished the name of Christians who brought the Republic to ruin. Charles Spurgeon, one of my favorite writers, he talks about that monument. It was a monument that was erected after the death of Diocletian, I should say. 
And Spurgeon had the greatest response. This is his only remark about the whole thing. He says, there's no grave that can be found for Christianity because the living need no tombs. When the enemies of the cross, when the enemies of the church, maybe even when the enemies of you surround you and you start to feel the pressure, remember two things. One, that God laughs. He's enthroned in heaven. He's still there. He's still alive. And two, God invites us to kiss the sun. May we do that this week. God bless you.